Now let's move on um, to discuss asymptomatic bacteria. And asymptomatic bacteria is the presence of bacteria, contam bacterial contamination of the normally sterile urine in the absence of symptoms. So these patients will have abnormal um, UAs and urine cultures, but they won't have any symptoms whatsoever. It's common even in healthy people but it's commonly seen in older adults and also in the pregnant population. E. coli is the most common organism. There's no proven efficacy for treatment with the exception of pregnant women. Um, very, very, very important to treat pregnant women because it will help prevent preterm labor. Um, it's important to treat men who are un undergoing urological surgical procedures. Uh, renal transplant patients, and total joint patients. I just want to swing back around to discussing pregnant women. Um, for treating asymptomatic bacteria in pregnant women, the uh, standard course is a 10 to 14 day course of ampicillin or cephalosporins, which are both generally safe and effective during any phase of pregnancy. And if patients are having persistent bacteria, um, they should be treated with a suppressive therapy for the remainder of their pregnancy. Cystitis or lower urinary tract infection occurs when there's invasion of the urinary tract by a pathogenic bacteria. This usually occurs as a result of contamination from the patient's own gastro gastrointestinal tract and, a, and also when there's an elevated pH of the urine, which creates a medium in which bacteria can grow and proliferate. Cystitis can occur in the urethra, causing urethritis, in the bladder, causing cystitis, in the bladder wall, causing interstitial cystitis, in the prostate gland, causing prostatitis. Infections can be acute or chronic, Chronic meaning that the infection is ongoing. Acute meaning that it's episodic. And it can be complicated or uncomplicated. Complicated is when the infection occurs in a male gender during pregnancy in patients with indwelling catheters, patients who have recurrent infections, patients with structure or functional problems with their urinary tract, if they've had recent instrumentation or surgery, if they have a history of multi-drug resistance, if they have diabetes history, or if they're immunocompromised. The most common pathogen is E. coli, and risk factors for infections include the female gender, because women have shorter urethras, hygiene, poor perineal hygiene can contribute to urinary tract infections, urinary obstruction, abnormalities, or trauma, kidney stones, atrophic vaginitis, incomplete bladder emptying, a weakened immune system such as diabetes, sexual intercourse, and foreign bodies including a catheter. It is also important to note that spermicidal agents adversely alter the vaginal uh, microenvironment and this can too predispose them to lower UTIs. Presenting complaints of, for patients with lower UTIs include dysuria, urgency, frequency, nocturia, low back pain or suprapubic pain, new or increased incontinence or confusion, in the absence of fever of greater than 101, chills, flank pain, or CVA tenderness and sepsis. Objective findings might include hematuria, either grossly or microscopically, cloudy malodorous urine, and suprapubic tenderness. We kind of briefly touched on this earlier, but testing for a lower urinary tract infection will include a urinalysis. Their pH is going to be alkaline. They may or may not have nitrates. Um, they're going to have some Luke esterase or um, some white blood cells. They may or may not have red blood cells. Um, if you choose to do a urine micro, then 
they're going to have bacteria cells present under the microscope. They may have some red blood cells as well. Um, a urine culture should be sent when the diagnosis is uncertain. So if a patient has less than two symptoms or when there is treatment failure um, or in the presence of additional risk factors such as an indwelling catheter, male gender, or females greater than 65 years of age. Management for a lower urinary tract infection that is uncomplicated includes a three-day course of Bactrim or a five to seven day course of nitroferritin or mac macrovid. If there's no improvement in two to three days, the recommendations are suggesting to culture. Ampicillin and sulfonamides have high, higher resistance rates, so they're a good choice if the susceptibility is known. Um, and then for uncomplicated lower UTIs, you should avoid fluoroquinolones um, because you should reserve the big guns um, when all possible. Um, complicated urinary tract infections um, should be treated with a 7 to 14 day course of fluoroquinolones. Um, and if the patient develops systemic symptoms, then hospitalization should be considered. Patients who are experiencing irritative symptoms, including frequency, urgency, dysuria, um, should be directed to pyridium for a short course um, consisting of two to three days to help alleviate those symptoms. If the patient does have a catheter, then you should remove that as soon as possible, as long as that is indicated. And there's really no evidence for efficacy of over-the-counter cranberry products. Um, fungal urinary tract infections should be treated with fluconazole 200 milligrams daily for 7 to 14 days. Patients who have chronic urinary tract infections, prophylactic therapy should be considered um, either daily suppressive therapy or postcoital therapy after intercourse. Um, trimethoprim, macrodantin, and cephalexin are all used in practice. And then it might uh, be a consideration as well if patients who are coming to you with recurrent UTIs, go ahead and refer them to a urologist so they can get some further evaluation for, for that. Upper urinary tract infections or pyelonephritis are infections of the upper urinary tract, including the kidneys and the ureters. These infections can be unilateral or bilateral, or they can be acute or chronic. Acute upper UTIs um, are an ascending infection from the bladder. Chronic upper UTIs are usually have no specific pathologic explanation. Um, Risk factors for pyelonephritis or upper urinary tract infections are congenital anatomic anomalies, urinary obstructions such as uh, kidney stones, in stage renal disease or in stage renal disease on hemodialysis, pregnancy, neurogenic bladder, um, severe reflux in children less than four years old. Um, these patients are sick and it can be life-threatening. It can progress to sepsis very, very quickly, especially in the elderly and the children and the immunocompromised people. Um, and it can precipitate premature delivery in pregnant females. So it's very, very important that you recognize the signs and symptoms of pylo and treat as soon as possible. As I mentioned, um, the clinical presentation of pyelonephritis, these patients are extremely, extremely sick. They have a fever, usually it's greater than 101. They have chills, they're shaking. They have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea at times, um, flank tenderness, um, fatigue. Um, some patients present asymptomatically. In, in practice, I honestly have not found that or seen that in urology, um, usually the patients that have pyelonephritis, they're wiped out. Um, 
and then the elderly folks may come in with some altered mental status so that's important to recognize as well on the exam these patients are having some uh, cva tenderness um, sometimes they'll have some tenderness in the abdominal region they'll have a fever as well um, and then our patients who are printing are presenting chronically they will have exhibit the same symptoms fever nausea poor appetite um, nocturia polyuria um, sometimes they have renal failure symptoms as well because it's ongoing for such a long, prolonged period of time they're not drinking they're not eating so their liver function or i'm sorry their renal function tests are off um, so that's important to recognize too Diagnosis of patients with pyelonephritis include recognizing that they have fever um, of greater than 101, they'll have chills, um, they'll have some flank pain and CVA tenderness. Some of these folks might be septic. Urinalysis, they will have bacteria, they'll have leukoesterase, um, usually they'll have nitrates as well, might have some red blood cells, um, white blood cells on the dipstick. Um, cultures are coming back greater than 100,000 um, of organisms present. Blood cultures um, should be obtained. They may or may not be positive depending on if the patient is septic and that infection has uh, spread to the bloodstream and made them bacteremic. Additional testing includes imaging. You might want to consider a renal ultrasound to see if there's any hydronephrosis or swelling of the kidneys uh, or a CAT scan, which would um, show whether or not there's any stranding of the kidneys, would be, which would be uh, indicative of pyelonephritis. And then also if there's any obstructing uh, kidney or ureteral stones, um, which would be uh, an urgent urological intervention, um, would be necessary to place a stent um, if that's the case. And then um, does this patient have chronic disease? Um, if they're chronically having positive urine cultures, chronically getting pyelonephritis, then a referral to a nephrologist for a possible kidney biopsy might be the next best step. Management for uncomplicated pyelonephritis um, can be managed outpatient as long as the patient has no risk factors for complicated infections and usually these patients can be treated with a course of oral antibiotics for seven to 10 days. Criteria for hospitalization for complicated pylo include if there's pregnancy, if the patient is uh, vomiting or dehydrated, then you'll wanna initiate a course of IV antibiotics um, after a culture ascent, of course. And then once they are improved, then you can transition to oral antibiotics. And usually these patients need a seven to 14 day case um, of antibiotics if the case is moderate to severe um, and 21 days if the patient's slow to respond. If there's no improvement in 48 hours, you're gonna need to reassess the patient, probably need to send a, um, another culture for sensitivity. Um, consider imaging if you've not done that to rule out any obstruction um, of the kidneys or the ureter and possibly surgery as I discussed earlier if there's a ureteral stone or a kidney stone that is obstructing that is causing the pyelonephritis a stent or a nephrostomy tube is warranted prostatitis can be categorized into four syndromes which can either cause infection of the prostate gland or inflammation of the prostate gland. Acute bacterial prostatitis, chronic bacterial prostatitis, chronic prostatitis, and chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and asymptomatic infl inflammatory prostatitis are all a part of that syndrome. Um, acute bacterial prostatitis and chronic bacterial prostatitis are defined by documented bacterial infections of the prostate and are treated with antibiotic therapy and supportive care. Your patients that come in with chronic prostatitis or chronic pelvic pain syndrome, um, they are very, very common urological complaints. Um, it's in the absence of a urinary tract infection, and this can be categorized in the inflammatory and non-inflammatory inflammatory subtype. 
I want to make a point and say that acute bacterial prostatitis is rare and it is caused by an acute urinary tract infection and it can progress to chronic bacterial prostatitis. These patients are sick. They come in with frequency, urgency, dysuria. Sometimes they have some blood in their urine and they complain of perineal discomfort. Risk factors include if they have a bladder outlet obstruction from an enlarged prostate or if they're immunocompromised. 5% um, of these folks do progress to chronic. Treatment for acute bacterial prostatitis include a urine culture, and you're giving antibiotics for these patients. Um, usually fluoroquinolones or Bactrim are good options empirically and you're giving these antibiotics for 30 whole days. So anywhere between four to six weeks, you're prescribing antibiotics so that medication can penetrate the prostate gland. Um, you can recommend analgesics, antipyretics, if they're having significant pain or a fever, alpha blockers such as Tamsulosin or Flomax um, might be given to them or considered to help improve outflow obstruction, um, and urinary reflux, so basically to help them pee better. Um, patients who are experiencing chronic pelvic pain syndrome, like I said in the previous slide, the underlying cause for that is inflammation. And that's usually um, found in patients who sit a lot at work, so they have sedentary jobs such as truck drivers, IT workers, um, and that pelvic floor is irritated and inflamed, they benefit the most from um, anti-inflammatories. So naproxen would be a good option. Um, ibuprofen would be a good option if they're able to take it. Asking them to avoid prolonged sitting if they're able to do that as well. But usually acute bacterial prostatitis, um, these folks are sick. Um, and pelvic pain syndrome is something that is going to constantly be something that they're battling. So treating them with antibiotics chronically would be doing them a, a disjustice and recommending the things that I mentioned with anti-inflammatories. Avoiding prolonged sitting is going to be the best um, treatment for them. Let's move on to kidney stones. So urolithiasis is another term for kidney stones of the urinary tract. And stones can develop anywhere along the urinary tract, including the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and also stones can occur in the prostate as well. There's a higher risk for kidney stones if you have a positive family history of stones. And here's a fun fact, stones are more common in the United States more than any place in the world. I can tell you I was not totally surprised by that only because the American diet is not that great. So that leads me into the causes. A high sodium diet, whether you're doing additive salt or there's hidden salt in the foods can put you at risk for stones. Not drinking enough water and staying hydrated can put you at risk for stones. Um, chronic infections can put you at risk for stones. If you have um, a high uric acid level that can increase your risk. Urinary stasis, so if patients have a history of uh, BPH or an enlarged prostate, they're not able to empty their bladder as well, that urine stasis in the bladder can crystallize and form bladder stones. And medications such as Topramax are commonly um, kidney stone formers. Stones can made, be made of calcium salts, struvite, uric acid, or cysteine. Types of stones, let's touch on this briefly. Calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate stones are the most common types of stones. They are predominantly found in men and these stones directly correlate with diet. So patients, again, who have a high sodium diet and they don't drink enough water and aren't hydrated are gonna usually form calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate stones. Struvite stones. Um, are responsible for the nasty, ugly staghorn stones um, that you can see. I think it's the second stone on the 
left hand side. Um, these stones are associated with urinary tract infections and they occur when the urine is alkaline and there's a urea splitting organism present. Uh, uric acid stones are formed from an increase in uric acid production or if there's ineffective elimination of uric acid. Um, usually these stones too can result from an intake of foods high in uric acid and these stones are radiolucent, meaning that they can only be visualized on a CAT scan. You cannot see these stones on plain film or an x-ray. Uh, cysteine stones are created because of a rare autosomal recessive disorder called cystinuria. Um, these stones are very rare, so you're not going to see these stones too often. Clinical presentation for urolithiasis is the classic renal colic. These patients are coming in with complaints of unilateral or bilateral flank pain. The pain is usually intermittent and it comes in waves. It's, they describe it as like a spasmy, sharp shooting pain that radiates to the abdomen, sometimes to the groin as well. They might have some associated nausea and vomiting, frequency and urgency to pee. Sometimes they're diaphoretic. They feel like they're not emptying their bladder completely. Sometimes they have some blood or hematuria in their urine as well. Um, a common complaint for patients who have stones in the distal ureter or stones that are in the ureter close down by the bladder, those are called distal ureteral stones. Um, stones that are also in the bladder or bladder stones, these patients are complaining of extreme irritative symptoms. So this is the dysuria patients. Sometimes they have the blood as well. Um, they usually are going often to the bathroom as well um, as that stone approaches the bladder or it's in the bladder. Um, objective presentation, you might note some abdominal distension and guarding when you press on their abdomen. They might have some decreased bowel sounds, a fever. They might be tachycardic or have some high blood pressure issues and some CVA tenderness as well. When patients come in complaining of the presenting complaints of a stone, it's important to rule out emergent conditions. So you want to make sure that they're not having issues with appendicitis or diverticulitis or pancreatitis um, or an ectopic pregnancy, first and foremost. But it's also important to recognize that these patients aren't sick from a septic stone as well, because stones that are obstructing the ureter can cause all the symptoms of a stone, and these patients are also very, very sick. So these patients with septic stones usually have, you know, the classic stone symptoms, the flank pain, the frequency, the urgency, the blood, the burning with the, when they urinate, but they also have a positive urine culture too, um, a positive urinalysis as well. If you do a CBC, these patients have a really high blood count and they have a fever as well. And then um, it's also important to note that their BUN and creatinine can be elevated too. So for patients who have an obstructed, infected stone, it's a urological medical emergency. So these patients, if they're being seen in the office by you, they should be going to the ER immediately. If they're in the ER, if you're working in a hospital setting, then the urology team should be called immediately to determine whether a stent or a nephrostomy tube should be placed. So imaging to um, determine whether a stone is present would be, you can start with a renal ultrasound. Renal ultrasounds are non-invasive. There's no radiation. It will give you, um, it will let you know if there's any hydronephrosis or swelling of the kidney present. Um, it will also let you know if there's any shadowing that could indicate whether a stone is present as well. Um, it's not the best image, but it will give you a result of whether or not there's hydronephrosis present. An x-ray will show um, whether or not a stone is present. This is a good picture of 
a stone um, seen on x-ray. That's exactly what it looks like on x-ray. But remember, uric acid stones aren't able to be seen on plain film or x-ray. So if you can't see a stone on x-ray and the patient has symptoms of a stone, you might have to go the next step up and do a non-contrast CT or CT stone study. And that will let you know if there's any hydronephrosis. It will let you know where that stone is, how big the stone is, um, and give you a, a good indication of what needs to be done next. There are several procedures that we can do for the management of kidney stones, one of which is placement of a ureteral stent. Now, I can say that ureteral stents should be placed, as I've mentioned several times throughout this lecture, if there are concerns for an infected obstructed stone. So if there's concerns for an infected obstructed stone, that stone cannot and will not be removed by a urologist. Because what happens is if you start going in and you start blasting that stone and trying to remove it, then that infection can spread to the bloodstream and make that patient septic. So if there's concerns for an infected obstructed stone, a ureteral stent will be placed. A ureteral stent can also be placed if the patient is having pain. So if there's uncontrolled pain um, secondary to a stone, and for instance, um, there's limited OR time or the, um, the, the reps who have the machine for the lithotripsy or the ureteroscopy are unavailable to come, a urologist might put a stent in just to help with alleviate the pain and the obstruction and then have the patient come back and address the stone at a later date. Uh, Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or ESWL is where um, shockwaves are distributed to, the, distributed to the outside of the body to break up the stone externally. It's non-invasive. Um, it is preferred for stones that are usually about a centimeter or less. Um, there are times where we do ESWL for stones that are, you know, a little bit bigger than one centimeter, but Usually, after you get above a centimeter, multiple treatments of ESWL are indicated. So, um, ESWL is an option for stones. The stone has to be seen on plain film or x-ray in order for ESWL to be done. Also, the patient cannot be on any blood thinners, anti, um, or I'm sorry, aspirin, or NSAIDs for seven days prior to ESWL because it does increase the risk for bleeding. Ureteroscopy with laser lithotripsy, um, that is when the a ureteroscope is placed in through the urethra and they thread a smaller scope up the ureter to blast the stone internally with a laser fiber. So these, um, this particular treatment is the gold standard for distal ureteral stones. So if a patient has a stone that's down by the bladder, um, a ureteroscopy with laser lith lithotripsy is the gold standard. Um, with this particular procedure, because we're going internally and blasting the stone, sometimes a ureteral stent will have to be placed after the procedure um, to allow that ureter to calm down and to relax for a few days after the procedure. Um, so that'll allow the urine to freely flow past that stent. That stent is maintained for anywhere between three to five days, and then that patient returns back to the office to have the stent removed. A percutaneous nephrolithotomy, or PCNL, that is where the um, urologist uses access from a nephrostomy tube that's placed into the it directly into the kidney to suction out stones um, that way. It is the most invasive treatment for kidney stones. Um, so usually this is reserved for your stones that are greater than a centimeter. So we're going to like the 1.5s and above and the staghorn stones that we talked about. Um, so a nephrostomy tube has to be placed by an interventional radiologist to get access to that stone. Then the urologist goes in and does the procedure uh, with the PCNL. 
all three of these procedures, or I should say four, including the ureteral stent, are done under general anesthesia. Um, indications for surgical referral would be if, like I said, there's abnormal renal function tests, if there is concerns for obstruction or sepsis, um, and significant infection. I did not mention this in the previous slide, but I do want to touch um, base on this right now. Stones that are generally five millimeters and less have about a 90 to 95% chance of passing. So if, patient, if a patient comes into the office, you suspect a stone, you get imaging, and you find that they have a stone that they're actively trying to pass in the ureter, and it's five millimeters or less, the patient isn't having any signs of sepsis, no signs of uh, a urinary tract infection that is um, complicated, then it's not unreasonable for you to recommend a trial of medical expulsive therapy to help them pass that stone. And what that means is that the, the patient is instructed to drink plenty of fluids, anywhere between 48 to 64 ounces of water, um, giving them a short course of pain medication you might want to consider um, narcotics such as Norco or Percocet if you have your DEA. If not, then NSAIDs or an anti-inflammatory is a, another good option to help relax that ureter. Um, and then also Flomax or Tamsulosin. That medication is used in men with an enlarged prostate to help them pee better, but it can also be used in patients who are passing ureteral stones. They work best when patients are passing um, proximal ureteral stones. So if, but you can still use them in patients who are passing distal stones. So what that medication does is it helps dilate or relax the ureter to increase the, the likelihood that they'll pass that stone. So that's not, you know, uncommon for patients to pass stones at home with medical expulsive therapy and then to return to the office in a week or two with reevaluation with an x-ray to see how things are progressing. If the patient worsens, of course, you know, I would direct them to the emergency room if they if their pain becomes uncontrolled, but by talking to the patient, figuring out a plan, um, allowing them a trial of passage at home is reasonable. Now, preventing stones, if a patient's able to um, pass their stone and they're able to collect it in the, um, in the um, stone collector, then you can send that out for stone analysis. And what that'll do is that will give you um, the answer to what kind of stone they just passed. So if it's a calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate stone, then you need to be educating your, your patient about increasing their fluid intake to 64 ounces a day and decreasing their dietary sodium every single day. Um, if the patient has a uric acid stone, then you might want to draw a uric acid level and see what their serum uric acid level is or you might want to think about doing a 24-hour urine to see what the chemical makeup of their urine is to see what other recommendations you can give them, whether it's a low oxalate diet or starting them on uh, a diuretic or um, whether it's starting them on sodium bicarb or potassium citrate. 